So hi, everybody. Welcome to our, um, I guess it's May, or May uh, uh, CCI Spark Series, a student, student storytelling series. Um, today, we're happy to have two more students um, present their, about their work. Um, first up will be Leto um, Wilene. Um, she'll be talking about maximizing co-ops and carving your unique, your unique career journey. Next up will be Sam Spiriti, uh, Shunani. Um, she'll be talking about the Humans with CCI project. If you follow CCI on Instagram, which I'm sure everybody does, you'll see the Humans of CCI um, project pop up every couple of weeks uh, in, with, with information about another CCI um, member of the CCI community. She'll talk more about that. So with this, I'm gonna turn things over to Leto. If you have questions, feel free to write them in the chat and I'll moderate. Or if um, at the end, you just wanna raise your hand and ask some questions, we'll be able to do that as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Leto and take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Dave. And thank you so much to the entire CCI team for this opportunity. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so, um, Hope every can someone give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen and hear me okay. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Dee. Uh, so, um, hello everyone. Uh, so today I will be speaking about um, two important things, two things that I really, really have um, valued a lot throughout my time at CCI in the last four years, um, which is about maximizing co-ops and how I've been able to carve my own unique career journey. And I think as I, you know, share some more things over the next few minutes, um, you definitely get to see that I didn't have a linear path to where I am today was quite, um, quite an interesting one even. Um, so I really hope that um, if you are a student, um, if you're just interested in like, knowing about these things, I really hope that you take a thing or two to help you maximize your co-ops and just how to go about carving your own um, career journey. So I'll split this into two parts. One will be like my background, my, my story, and then the second part being focusing solely on co-ops. So who am I? Um, so currently a junior um, um, studying computing and security technology. I also recently added a minor in human computer interaction. Uh, I am a senior dean's ambassador in the college and I'm also a member of the inaugural diversity, equity and inclusion council within the college as well. Um, I am the co-founder of Students of LinkedIn. Students of LinkedIn is a 7,000 plus global community with a mission to educate, encourage and expose students um, to leverage LinkedIn. Um, I'm also an incoming product management intern at Intuit for the summer. Um, I start in about, um, about four weeks. Um, and then overall, I think I just like to see myself as a storyteller. I love telling stories, I love meeting other people and I love sharing my insights. Um, which is why I'm here today. So what is my story? Um, this is just a picture of me when I was little. Um, so over the next few slides, I'm gonna just talk you through like my experience, how I even got to, um, to where I am today. So actually, before I go to this slide, um, let me just start off by saying, um, so when I moved, when I came to, to Drexel, um, I was initially a biomedical engineering major. Um, I thought I wanted to pursue medicine. Um, I was, really, really bent on that. Um, after my first term, one thing I really love about Drexel's curriculum, and I'm sure um, some students here can agree with this, is Drexel's curriculum kind of throws you into your core classes, even as a freshman. So as a biomed major, I was already taking like my core biomed classes, um, being very, very engrossed into, into the major. And I think it was in that first term, I was like, I really don't think I want to do this. Like, I don't see myself doing this long term. Um, I think, you know, medicine was just something I had held on to for so long because I was scared to try something else. But when I really saw like or tried to picture um, myself again, I'm a very big picture person. So I love I love thinking way ahead. <laughs> so, and sometimes I, I guess it has its ups and downs. Um, but when I just thought about like, my future, when I thought about like what I was really interested in, I just didn't see medicine aligning with that. So on one end, I was happy because I knew what I didn't want to do. But now the the main question was, what do I want to do? Um, and over the, I think the first time I drank, so I was really confused. Um, I think one of my just days out in the library, I was just searching. Um, I found out about the College of Computing and Informatics, and I found out that um, Dee, who's also on this call, she's an advisor, um, would, would actually be my contact person. So I remember reaching out to her via email, you know, hoping to like, just talk more with her about like my dilemma, hoping to get some insights. Um, I didn't really know anything about tech. Um, it just seemed interesting. It seemed like it was something that I never like saw myself ever doing, and which is why I I was rather engrossed to it, um, rather than like the other options that I had. And 
eventually um, had a call with her. She kind of encouraged me to, you know, try out a couple of classes. I took some, I was taking the CI sequence, I was taking some CS courses, um, and then eventually found my current major, which is the CST major. And the reason why I chose that major over CS was because I realized that while I really enjoyed coding or I loved the challenge, I, I was more a hands-on person. I loved, I love how CSD sits on like, right on that middle spectrum of like being very theoretical, but also being very application based. Um, and that was what I wanted. I think it just fits um, my interest um, the best. So that was why I eventually, you know, chose to, to major in computing and security technology. So as you can see, I coming to Drexel, I really, I really did not know like what I wanted to do. Um, tech, security, all of that was completely foreign to me. Um, so in the next one, I'm going to talk about some challenges I encountered um, during that phase of my life. So one was, like I said, just again, getting to know about CCI um, and getting to take like some of my CS courses in my second term at Drexel, I didn't know how to code. Um, in high school, all, all I had learned was just basic HTML, which is nothing compared to um, my CS 171 courses. Um, so that was one challenge I, I really I encountered. The second was just being an international student. Um, I constantly heard this notion of, oh, you can't get this, you can't do this, you can't get this opportunity. When I was applying for scholarships, um, it was always this constant, oh, you're not eligible. And it just became like, it became like this label I had attached to myself. Um, another thing was there were really no, no role models that I, I could really look up to. I felt very alone. Again, being someone that knew nothing, knew little to nothing about tech, I really didn't have like a mentor or someone to look up to to even guide me um, at, at this transition in my life. And then the most dreaded um, feeling ever is the imposter syndrome. I remember sitting in my um, CI1 101, 102, 103 classes, just feeling very, you know, out of place, really feeling like I, I didn't have, you know, I didn't. I, I didn't know enough. Um, so rather than answering questions, I was I was very like, I would shy away from anything that would kind of put me in the limelight. Um, and that was because I doubted my abilities and doubted you know what I had to bring to the table and to my peers. Now, this is kind of how I went about, you know, and count, um, or how I went about overcoming these challenges. Um, and some of them, I'm still working on them. I'm not in any way perfect or seeing I have mastered any of these um but for not knowing how to go so what I did was I began learning on my own right so I was going to office hours in addition to you know just the coursework my CS classes were providing me I was ensuring that I was also doing my own personal learning this was through Coursera um, Code Academy um and I just ensured that I, at least I understood the basics I understood the main concept so that when I was in class um it was easy for me to make those connections um being an international student honestly this is something that I'm also still working on um I stopped seeing myself as a victim or one that you know would always be hindered or restricted I think if anything I started to see that being an international student helps me to bring the unique perspective and bring a unique you know just flair to wherever I, I am whether it's a team whether it's my classes or whether it's a group project so I started owning and embracing my diversity in thought and speech and even the way I went I, I went about you know just thinking about problems and problem solving um, in terms of community honestly this is also something that um, took me quite a while um, especially because I was a really shy person I think people struggle to believe that when I tell them that now but I really really was shy but when it came to community I think one thing I really had to do was to put myself out there so for me that looked like you know sophomore year once sophomore year began rather than just attending classes alone which is what I was doing my freshman year I was really you know engaging I was going to events I would you know either look on dragon link or like follow some pages on, on Instagram and just look out for you know when the next general body meeting was happening um and and the other things I was doing was I was ensuring that I wasn't just leaving the meeting right after. I would stay back to engage with some people, to talk to some people, you know, just make those connections. Um, yes, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I literally feel my stomach not in a tie because of fear. But I love that I was still feeling that fear and still doing it afraid anyways. And it has really, really paid off. And then in terms of um, imposter syndrome, again, another one that I'm still working on, I think I really just had to build my self-confidence. I had to, um, you know, crowd out or... or cloud out like every person's you know opinions what people would say what people would think and really just you know um sometimes it would literally look like me just standing in front of my mirror telling myself affirmations reminding myself you know how far I've come how knowing that yes I might not know everything but I know that I'm very very passionate I'm very very eager I'm curious to learn and I think no matter what um that would still set me apart so I think it was really just me looking within myself and and 
choosing to see like the value I still brought, whether or not I was, you know, all the way up there or, or w- whatever else I used to, to scale myself, I think was really just ensuring that um, I was not comparing myself to people, <laughs> doing, um, only realizing that my journey is unique. And for that reason, um, I can go at my own pace. Um, so just a quick one about um, finding mentors, but I really think this is something that um, I just touched on it in the previous slide, but I really think this is something I really just want to spend a few minutes talking about um, and how I personally went about finding mentors. Because I think many times I've heard students ask me, oh, how do I even find mentors? I really want that guidance. I want people to be able to help me. Um, and I said, this is kind of how I went about it. Um, this is not like a blueprint, but this is just what I did. So like I said, I, I would say with attending events, I was exposing myself to those people, right? I couldn't just attend classes, you know, stay in my dorm room and expect to suddenly like, you know, find mentors. I had to expose myself and put myself in those places where I could most likely find those people. So for me, that looked like conferences, for example, the Great Hopper Conference, um, I know um, before COVID, like CCI would have lots of corporate partner events. I would attend events like that. Um, I would, you know, just find opportunities even outside of Drexel as well and ensure that I was um, um, attending events like this. In fact, there was a summer actually in 2019 where I was attending classes full time, but also I think I was going to New York every summer. Um, I didn't have to, but I knew that there was, I I had a goal, which was to really expand my network and to attend more events. Um, And that was what um, I was able to do, right? And Again, even though sometimes it looked like I was doing too much, I really think it has paid off. And even though I didn't get to, even though not everyone became my mentor, I think I still have those connections that I can still leverage even till today. Um, The other, I would say, which is very closely related to attending events is just expanding your network. And um, one of my favorite ways to do this is by using LinkedIn. I wasn't just connecting to other Drexel students. I was ensuring that I was connecting to um, just people, whether like they were, you know, other CS majors, People who had similar interests with with like myself in like DNI, in 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 security product. Like I was just finding commonalities and connecting with people um, based on those factors. And then the most important thing I would just say is being authentic. I think um, I rather than force a relationship, I, I have allowed my mentorship relationships to form organically, right? So I never I never even had to ask anyone to be my mentor. I think the relationship just evolved to that point. So I always tell people that rather than just asking someone to be a mentor, why don't you just focus on being yourself, right? Focus on providing value because I think mentorship is a two-way relationship. You're not just taking from that person, also ensuring that you're giving. Um, a common thing that many students say is, oh, I don't have anything to give to my mentor. Well, yes, you do. You have your time, you have your ideas, you have resources to share. Obviously, no one's asking you to like maybe get them a job, but just know that even as a student, you have value to provide to a professional, to your mentor, or just to your community at large. So this is how I personally have been able to find my, um, to find my mentors um, organically and have long lasting relationships with them. All right, so that's a bit about my background. Um, I will kind of move now to co-ops because as much as you know, I've talked about you know attending events, connecting, I also think my co-op experiences have played a big role in shaping you know the person I am today and shaping my interest. Um, this is actually one of the things that I didn't know Drexel had until I got to Drexel and I'm so grateful I came to Drexel. Um, CCI has an amazing stellar um, co-op opportunity that, that students can leverage and I have been able to leverage as well to help me get to where I am today. So before I jump into like my personal co-op experience, I'm just going to share some application tips for maybe those who are spring summer um, um, co-ops um, who are applying or who just plan to apply for other opportunities as well. So one thing I really, um, if I could tell myself, if I could give myself some advice, the first time I applied is to not restrict my search to your major alone. So I think because my first term I was in CST or my first co-op, sorry, I was in CST, I was only looking at the, um, CST opportunities. I didn't look at CS. I didn't look at data science. I didn't look at IS. Um, obviously, yes. If you know, if you know 100% what you want, feel free to just you know narrow things down. But I think sometimes one thing I've noticed is as a CSD major, there might be opportunities in IS or or data science that I might also find interested. So I, I ensured that um, I, going forward, I ensured that I wasn't just sticking to my major. Yes, maybe that would be my first place to look, but I was ensuring that I was also looking at other majors as well. Um, I also would encourage people to look beyond. FCDC's database. And the reason why I say that is because, um, especially COVID, I think COVID really showed uh, us the importance of, um, of um, 
I think like just diversifying your op- like opportunities and like diversifying like where you look for for opportunities, right? I think um, while SCDC has a great amount of opportunities and very very amazing opportunities at that, I have also been able to look outside of um, um, the database to be able to find, find my opportunities. For example, my summer internship um, happened in a few weeks. I um, I didn't find that through SCDC. I had to kind of like um, you know apply or actually I did, actually didn't apply, but I had to you know. Um, Put myself out there and be open to um, looking elsewhere outside of what Drexel already provided. Um, the third thing I would say is it's important to tailor your resume to the job description. So identify keywords, right? So for example, maybe a software engineering role requires you to have experience with you know certain um, programming languages or certain tools. Ensure that you're having those things clearly. Um, written in in your resume. But however, this tip, I, w- I would say though that because I believe SCDC requires you to only have one resume, sometimes you have to only have one resume for all your opportunities. But if you are um, maybe looking elsewhere and you can apply, you can have different resumes for different opportunities, I would definitely recommend you to tailor um, your resume um, based on the job description and based on the role. Um, this is actually one of my favorite tips actually is do not be moved by the names or the title, right? I thoroughly read through the job description and then ask yourself, can I see myself doing this? One of um, the biggest mistakes I think I made first, my first and second co-ops was just to, you know, if if a title of co-op sounded really catchy, I would just put it in my cart without really taking the time to read that job description and really asking myself, you know, what are they looking for? Do I match what they're looking for? And can I see myself doing this? I think these are three very important questions you want to ask yourself before, you know, you 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 just go ahead and add things to your cards because I realize that sometimes companies can have really, really fancy titles, but the work, which is like the content of what you're doing does not match that at all. So it's very important for you to just take out that time. Yes, I know it's more time, but I also think six months is a long time that you want to ensure that you're doing something you actually enjoy or something you find interesting. So be be very, very intentional about reading that job description. So let me kind of you know, walk you through my co-op experience. Um, so my first co-op, I was actually a software engineering research intern within the college. I was working in the privacy, security, and automation lab. Um, now, I, I kind of broke this down to like, again, telling you like the timeline and then telling you like a lesson I took from this, just to tell you how I was able to use the lessons I learned to help me get to where I am today. So from this first research experience, I realized that I really, really do not like software engineering or coding as much and research as well, which is why I'm not sure about pursuing a PhD. Um, however, even though it was such a great learning opportunity, this is something I definitely took away that I'm not, I don't see myself, you know, sitting behind a computer screen coding nine to five every day. I really liked something more dynamic. I liked something more interactive. Um, so this was something that really helped me ensure that I was not going to find myself in this same role again for another opportunity, whether it was co-op or a full-time opportunity. So my second co-op, I did something completely different. I was working at JP Morgan and I was a QA intern. Um, now, with this experience, I would definitely say I, I would rank it a bit, a bit better than my software engineering research internship, but I also found out that QA was not so interesting to me, right? Um, thankfully, during my time at JP Morgan, I was working in a cross-functional team. And the highlight of that experience for me was I got to shadow PMs, um, PMs are product managers. Um, and that was where I found out that I was actually more intrigued by PM. However, because my role was very specific QA, I still had to you know, ensure that I was doing my day-to-day job, but I was ensuring that I was also connecting with PMs just to get to know more about what they do. By my third co-op, I was more, um, I was more clear, right? So software engineering, no, no. QA, no, no. Um, I found out that PM was a perfect blend for me because it involved me being technical, but also allowing me to be very, very, um, um, very, very uh, like interdisciplinary, right? It allows me to be technical, be very business minded, be very strategy driven, be very creative, being very design and data driven, like all of these things that I know I love to do um, in a day to day role. So, my third co op actually that I recently finished about two months ago, I was actually at Above Board. Above Board is a startup, um, and I was a product management intern there. Now, this one thing I think the lessons I took from this experience was that startup culture is so different. Now, for me, coming from a company like JP Morgan, where it's um, a really huge financial institution to to a very small startup, um, the culture was completely different. Um, However, I think what I also really learned was that I really loved PM. I really loved, um, you know, being able to, to 
provide my insights to help companies and help um, businesses like drive and, and see what the next step to take is. Um, so I think I'm so glad that my co-op really gave me that clarity. And now again, following in these PM footsteps, I'm also continuing as still in PM um, at Intuit um, for the summer. So just um, again, this is kind of like, I guess the, the meat of, of this part of part two is kind of like how I've been able to use Oh, things I've learned from each of these three different experiences um, and how I've been able to, to maximize um, my opportunities. Now, if there's one thing I would have told myself again is to approach every co-op and internship as a two-way relationship. I think many times students are just so grateful to be working at a, a company, they, they see it as such a privilege and by all means it is. However, I also think don't forget that you also have something to bring to the table and that's why they gave you that offer, right? They saw your potential, they saw your intelligence, they saw how how stellar you are, right? So ensure that you're also getting invested into, don't just invest into the company, ensure that you're actually leaving the opportunity with something um, tangible or just something very noteworthy that you would take with you for the rest of your career. So one thing I'll definitely say is do not approach the opportunity casually, right? Set your professional and personal goals. Is it learning a new skill? Is it learning how to communicate more? Is it, you know, putting yourself out there or, or doing more leadership opportunities? Like clearly define what it is. It could be two, it could be three things. It could be just one thing, but ensure that before entering any co-op or internship, you're clearly telling yourself what you want to make out of, out of the opportunity. Um, the second thing I'll say is to get on the same page with your manager no assumptions made. Um, and re the reason why I say this is because it's so easy to do good work, but not the right work. It's so important to ensure that you are asking your manager what is required of you. Are there any you know, projects at hand? Um, what does success look like, right? Because you don't just want to think you're doing well. You actually want to know that you're doing well in the role, especially if you hope to get a return offer or continue with the company later down the line. So it's very important to ensure that you are on the same page with your manager. Um, regularly ask for feedback. While I was at JP Morgan, actually, every week, and even at my um, last co-op um, at the startup, I was meeting, meeting with my managers every week to ask for feedback. Not just my managers, but also asking like my colleagues, people that um, just maybe I only interacted with very, not as much, just to see how people perceive me. Um, it was very, very helpful feedback. Obviously, there were things that I could work on that I worked on during the internship. Other things, I still have to keep on working on them even after the internship. But it was just nice to get feedback to, you know, to, to help me improve as a person um, and as an intern. The other thing I would definitely say is to connect with employees outside of your team. It's so easy. This was something I really struggled with as well, even at JP Morgan. I was just so focused on my day-to-day -day, um, task. And while that is great, you also want to ensure that you are maximizing your time being there by expanding um, your, your horizons and your, your, your network, right? So for example, if I was just on my QA team, I probably would not have known that I could talk to the PMs or I could talk to um, um, like the marketing teams and the data teams. So I was ensuring that even though they were not within my core digital team, I was also scheduling coffee chats with them, um, sending messages on Skype and, and just, I was really just maximizing that intern status. Mm -hmm. Um, the fifth thing I would say is to not be restricted by that intern status um, and where, whatever it is you want to share, don't be afraid to, to do that. I think many times as an intern, um, it's so easy to feel like, oh, I, I'm, I'm at the bottom of the ladder. I don't know as much. Um, I should be careful of what I'm saying. While I, I kind of get that, I also think um, being an intern is actually such a privilege and there's there's so many things you can do in fact if anything people are always so willing to help people are always so willing to answer your questions so don't shy away don't think you don't know yes you might not know as much as other members of your team but you also have something to offer to the table so ensure that you're not letting yourself feel lower than you are see yourself as part of the team see yourself as an employee not just an intern and then lastly i would say it's important to take inventory of weekly accomplishments um, my last co-op this is something i didn't do my first two co-ops um, but i did very very um, intention i did very um, carefully in my last co-op every week i had a notion page where i would write out what i accomplished the things i did if there were things i could not finish i would ensure that i was keeping that for the next week um maybe it was a feedback i got maybe it was a compliment maybe it was a shout out like everything both the highs and lows i was documenting all of this and this helped me when it came to carving out the resume points um, for my resume so 
if I should just summarize everything um, from both the first and second part out, I really love this quote by Arakat. And it says, there is no recipe. There is no one way to do things. There's only your way. And if you can recognize that in yourself and accept and appreciate that in others, you can make magic. I think this has been um, a driving force for me in my life is I, I try not to do things the default way. I'm very passionate about um, just finding what works for me, right? Whether someone else has done that before or not. Um, as you can see, if I was just sticking to the conventional, maybe sweet or software engineering path, I clearly knew that that wasn't working for me and I wasn't afraid to try something else. I wasn't afraid to try PM, um, or, no, sorry, to try QA, to try PM. I also tried technology consulting as well um, on the side, right? So I, I think when it comes to, um, which kind of brings me to the, to the choice of words in my title, um, Max, carving your own unique career journey. Um, one of the greatest advice I got personally was to not see my career as a destination, but to see it as a journey. So you can make stops, you can add things, you can drop things. It's up to you to carve it however way you see fit. Um, take off those rules, take off those, um, those like you can, you can literally see, see your career as a canvas and feel free to paint it however way you choose to. So um, I know I kind of said a lot in the last few minutes. Um, if you do want to get in touch, these are the best ways to reach out to me. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn, um, on Instagram, or you can send me an email. Um, that is all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lado. That was great. Um, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to yell it out, shout it out, or put it in the chat, and I can read it out for you. Great talk. I really appreciate all the points that you made on the first part where you talk about some of the um, struggles, um, imposter syndrome and feeling that you don't belong and all that. I can't tell you how common that is. I feel it myself. I go to my classroom and I've been doing this for more than 20 years. I still feel a little bit of butterflies in my stomach at the beginning of the term. I still feel like I'm one of very few faculty, female faculty members. Um, so yeah, it, it is very real and it's very important to remind yourself why you're here. So great talk, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your experience too. Anyone else? So we have a comment, uh, great talk. I too relate to many of the things you've said with regard to imposter syndrome and all. Um, if there are no other comments, um, feel free again to keep in touch. If there are other questions or comments, um, I'll be more than happy to, to hear them. So thank you so much. Right, great, thank you, Lotto. Um, presentation was great. Um, now I'm gonna turn things over to Sam Scruti. Um, Sam Scruti will be speaking about the Humans of CCI project. So take it away. And Leto, I know you have to go. So thank you again. And um, I'll, I'll speak to you soon. All right, thank you. All right, um, hello everyone. So a lot of you are familiar with Humans of CCI. In fact, some of you here have actually been featured on it. Um, for those who are not familiar, Humans of CCI is a collection of photo stories that showcase the unique yet relatable journeys of members of the CCI community. From students to faculty to professional staff, Humans of CCI captures the true essence of being human and brings to people the inspirational stories that make up all the people in CCI. So just to show you what a typical Humans of CCI story looks like, I will share my screen. And that is um, our story where we start with a sentence, something that's very, um, I'm at a loss for words, but something that is very um, gripping in a way, which will you know, get the reader to really read what's written. And I would typically interview our subjects in person and then take a picture of them. This is Professor Brian Stewart and this has to be one of my favorite stories. And he talked a little bit about a pivotal moment in his life. And so Human to CCI is filled with many such stories. So I remember when I started this project, 
things were getting really difficult for me at one point in my life. And I had this internal narrative that said that I am the only person going through this struggle and that everybody else around me is perfect with no problems. And it was not until I spoke to a friend where he mentioned his problems, he mentioned things he was struggling with in his personal life. And that is when it sort of occurred to me that, yeah, my problems might be unique to me, but everybody has their own set of unique challenges and problems that they face in their everyday lives. We are always so occupied in our crazy busy lives with classes, co-op, extracurricular activities, job search, and so much more that we only notice the superficial aspects of life around us. And in situations like these, it is very easy to look around and perceive everybody else's life to be perfect. This is because we only see the surface. The classmate that, you know, looks like he has his life together, you don't see his internal struggles. You don't see all the hard work he has to put in. You only see the end product and just assume that he got there easily or on his first try or that academics just come to him naturally. We don't see his journey. We only see the end result. We don't see him spending hours at his desk trying to figure out why his program keeps crashing. And just because that internal hardship is not visible to us, that does not mean that it doesn't exist. When this realization dawned on me, I wanted to have a medium to showcase that everyone has struggles and that everyone overcomes barriers and that nobody is flawless. That is what truly makes us human. And I wanted Humans at CCI to serve as that reminder to reiterate that we are human beings who have imperfections and that is perfectly normal. I had been following Humans of New York for several years. Uh, Humans of New York is a photo story blog, just like Humans of CCI. That's where the inspiration comes from. And over the years, that blog has achieved so much in terms of connecting people, making people realize that nobody's perfect. And sometimes reading a few of the stories, I have personally felt very inspired and motivated. I'm sure that Humans of New York has had a similar effect on people all around the world. And so with Humans of CCI, I really wanted to instill that same sense of community within the college. We are who we are today because of the challenges that we have faced, barriers we have overcome, struggles we have gotten through. And if it wasn't for that journey, those struggles, we would not be the people that we are today. And Humans of CCI celebrates that very journey. Next month actually marks two years since I first pitched the idea to the CCI communications team. This was about a month or two before I started working with them officially. They loved the idea and they were very supportive and encouraging and really pushed me to pursue this. And I collected a few stories initially and then we launched in November of 2019 and the response was overwhelming. People loved it. And one of our stories actually even made it to um, the official Drexel University's Instagram. So that was a proud moment for me. <laughs> And back before the pandemic happened, I would interact with people in person because I have been part of the college for so long and I've done a lot as a peer mentor, as a teaching assistant and a few other roles, I knew a lot of people. And so initially I would just approach people that I have some sort of familiar familiarity with and then ask if they would like to share their stories and get featured. And so I would sit down with them ask them an open-ended question, something like, you know, describing something pivotal in their life or something that they overcame and has, and that thing that has made them the person they are today. And I would also take a few pictures of them to accompany with their story. It was really wonderful to be able to interact one-on-one -on -one with students, faculty, and professional staff. But all of that really changed drastically when COVID-19 struck. So when the pandemic began, it was, I was just instantly overcome with the worry that humans at CCI would lose this momentum and would eventually fade out and become obsolete because a huge part of the series was the in-person interview. After giving it some thought, I decided to change my approach to the interview process, adapting it to the remote nature of things. It was difficult at first. And so I would email a few people, sometimes no responses, but then the more I started emailing people, the right kind of people, they would reach back and, you know, they would say that they're interested. And then I would ask them to send a semi-professional photo along with a written response to a few introspective questions that I would ask them. 
And to make sure the series was relevant to current times, I decided to ask um, the interviewees questions related to their feelings about the pandemic, their coping strategies, and just everything they were doing to keep themselves occupied and not panic with this unfamiliar situation. COVID-19 brought about an extremely uncertain time to live in and people everywhere had similar emotions of feeling lost, scared, alone, depressed, and a myriad of other emotions. For the initial months of the pandemic, we adapted the series to focus on social distancing stories where people opened up about how they are coping, the things they were doing while staying indoors, whether they were by themselves or they were quarantined with their families and just everything they did to keep their morale up. Students talked about how they adapted to different methods for being productive with schoolwork, faculty and staff touched upon challenges they faced when moving to remote work. As the pandemic progressed, so did human the CCI's themes. After social distancing stories, we moved to talking about the long-term challenges of staying indoors and how people were coping with those. Around this time, I noticed human the CCI transition from being merely a storytelling series to more becoming a medium for people to feel connected in a time where everyone felt so disconnected from the rest of the world. People craved that familiarity. It helped them feel less alone, feel more connected to their peers and professors. It became an important point of connection, especially for students who had just started at Drexel and those that were about to graduate. So I'm really glad I was able to reinforce that strong sense of community during a time when people felt extremely displaced. With the end of 2020 upon us, I wanted to do something special for the series. And so I decided to reach out to a pool of professors, students and professional staff to look back at their 2020 in hindsight and to reflect on how their year went, how they overcame the unique challenges, how they stayed strong during one of the most unprecedented times in human history. And when gathering their stories, their responses were very reflective and they really opened up. I think that really helped our audience feel even more connected than before. It was really touching to watch something that I have given a lot of dedication to grow into something so wonderful and so important to the college and its core values. And now that I'm graduating in four weeks, it's a little bit of a bittersweet feeling. Sweet because I get to go on to the next exciting chapter of my life but bitter because I will also be leaving behind a project that I really hold close to my heart. I'm excited to see what Human to CCI develops into and I'm really looking forward to watching it grow. Thank you. Thank you, Sanspree, that was great. And uh, yeah, I kind of know what it's like to, um, I think that anybody who works here, Faith, I'm looking at you, uh, because you're in the middle of the screen. Um, it, it's kind of a great feeling to, to start something and then see it grow and then a little scary to know that um, at some point it's gonna, you're gonna leave or, or it's gonna be turned over to somebody else. But um, I'm sure it's in great hands um, as you go. Um, does anybody have any questions? Again, if you wanna write in the chat, go ahead or if you just wanna um, yell it out, go for it. That's great, this is Faith. Um, I'm wondering if you feel like you've learned anything um, through interacting with so many different people that has impacted the way that you operate like in class or on co-op, just kind of lessons that you've taken from this uh, storytelling series and how they apply in other spaces. That's a good question. So um, I think what really changed for me was I was able to humanize people more. And there was this period where I was a teaching assistant during the pandemic. And I was also interacting with students in um, for humans at CCI. And that really helped me understand the struggles of people I was grading, students that would come to office hours a little more lost and having a little bit of a more difficult time understanding what they probably wouldn't have found so challenging when if we were in person. And so it definitely helped me humanize my students even more than I was able to before. I think that really, really helped me. And even ge in general, I think I started understanding people better and I started understanding some reactions from people better. So 
it definitely helped me become more empathetic. So a question came in, um, do you have a handpicked successor for the Humans of CCI? I wouldn't say handpicked, but we do have another student worker with the communications team who is a wonderful photographer, very, very talented. And um, I think for a little bit, he would be handling it. I don't know if um, the comms team plans on finding someone specifically for humans of CCI, but yeah, Faith and I have to map that out. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Here's another one. How would you picture yourself? How would you picture yourself in the humans of CCI series? That's a good question. So um, I was actually featured myself um, about eight or nine months ago, where I talked about losing my co-op to the pandemic and the challenges that that brought about for me as an international student, as someone who only got two co-ops in the five year um, time period because of changing majors late and all of that. And I really opened up about my challenges and my struggles. It was very interesting to be on the other side of this because I really had to push myself to open up, but be succinct at the same time. And so it really helped me reflect and become more introspective. It was, it was definitely a weird um, feeling at first, but I think I really enjoyed being on the other side of this. Hi Sanskriti, this is Adelaida. I have enjoyed reading your post. There is this, this feeling that I think everybody can relate that you mentioned. Um, you don't know what happens behind closed doors for other people, like whoever, you know, you see that may seem all is good and everybody has their struggles. And sometimes we just don't think about it in terms of other people and ourselves. So it's been very interesting to read all the stories, the poignant ones, the other ones that are a little more light because you get this, you get, to know this little aspect of other people, otherwise you have you have not. And in some pieces you get to see a little bit of, like we are all vulnerable, whether we wanted to show it uh, or not. And so it, it is like, it's refreshing to see this and to see we're all humans. We all have these fears and these things that excite us and these other things that make us vulnerable. So it's, it's a nice way to see this other aspect of people that are around us, students, TAs, staff, professors. Um, I think it's, it's, it, you, you have a great project. It makes, makes me feel like I know a little bit more about these people that I'm, I work with and I relate with. Um, and I hope the project is going because it, it's a really good, great one. Thank you so much. That really means a lot to me. Anything else? Um, so Steve, thanks for the comment. One of my friends was profiled in the Humans of New York series recently. And since I had never heard of it before, my first thought was they copied off that, they copied that off Sanskriti. <laughs> yeah, no, Humans of, uh, Humans of New York definitely came first, kind of set off the inspiration. Hey, this is, this is Kathy Funk. I'm a uh, associate dean for finance and administration. And I just want to uh, also say, uh, reiterate what Adelaide is and the, the human side of it. Um, I'm the finance person who mainly says no to things. Um, and so people probably don't see the human side of me. And uh, that was really great that I have uh, developed a rapport with Sanskriti and appreciated being asked to do that. So thank you, Sanskriti. It's a, it's a great series. So thank you very much. Thank you. It was I, it was my pleasure to have you featured on there, and I think it definitely did help um, help me realize that like, hey, everyone is really human, and I was really touched reading your piece, and I think it was very inspirational, especially being a woman who's trying to make it out in the world. Definitely meant a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else? So 
So if not, um, I want to thank Shane Spreedy, and I also want to thank Leto. This was a great presentation. I think both these topics are great and very interesting. Um, so I want to thank you both. Um, obviously, this is being recorded, so if you want to go back and rewatch it, um, it'll be posted. I'll, I'll work with Faith to get it posted in the next couple of days. Uh, and for any students out there, if you are interested in participating in a Spark Series talk, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is, is raken at drexel.edu, R-A-I-K-E-N at drexel.edu. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and just let me know. And um, we schedule these. I try to schedule these more, right? I try to schedule these fairly regularly. Um, however, with the pandemic, it's become a little it's become a little more difficult. But if you are interested in in, in giving a talk, um, feel free to reach out to me. We've had um, undergrad, grads, and doctoral students, um, Adelaida, and I see Alex out there, and Ed Kim. Um, if you have any students, or in Kathy as well, um, if you interact with any students and you think they might be um, good speakers for this, or might have interesting story to tell, feel free to reach out. Feel free to have them reach out to me, or just reach out to me in general, and I can reach out to the students. Um, this is. Um, this was a project that came from the, um, the Dean's Innovation Challenge from a couple of years ago. So we are happy that it will continue going on. And hopefully when we do get back to campus, we can continue to have it more regularly in person in the lobby. Um, so with that, if there's no more questions, I wanna say thanks everybody. Uh, thank you for attending and I look forward to uh, sending on an announcement for the next talk soon. Thanks Faith, uh, Faith put the form in there. So if there's a Google form you can fill out, there is a form you can fill out that, um, you can just fill out, it goes right to me, and um, I can work with you directly to get your talk scheduled. Thanks, everybody, and I look forward to, talk, to talking to everybody soon. Thank you, Dave, for setting this up, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you. That was great.